Good evening. I want to welcome you to the second um, leadership lecture series talk today, teaching our alumni. Uh, first time we have had two talks back to back. And um, our speaker today is uh, Sharat uh, Potraju from the um, batch of 2002 BTEC Chemical. Um, he is the co founder and CEO of uh, Mobstack. Uh, you may, some of you may have attended the lecture given by his. Um, Co-founder uh, Ravi Pratap. How many of you were at the talk? Anybody? Okay, so it'll be a continuation of the story for some of you. Um, very happy that uh, Sharath is here. Um, so I'll ask him to give his talk and maybe say a little bit about your days in IIT Madras before you get started. I understand you're the Gen Sec and all kinds of stuff. So uh, at the outset, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Nagarajan, for this uh, incredible honor and privilege actually to be back at IIT Madras. Uh, I think about a decade back, uh, I was sitting in these seats. I, I, I would say actually ICSR is one of the buildings which has not really changed. Most of them look a lot more swankier than what I remember them to be, but ICSR just seems just the same. So I guess uh, ICSR was ahead of its times in 2002 or 2001. Uh, so like uh, Professor Nagaraj mentioned, uh, I'm a class of 2002. I did actually my chemical engineering undergrad from uh, IIT Madras. Uh, 98 to 2002 is where I was in uh, IIT. I actually was in uh, the Godavari Hostel. Uh, was also the general secretary at Godavari. Uh, fought a bitterly campaigned uh, or contested uh, election for Institute Culture Secretary in 2001, and uh, I sadly lost it by a few votes. I still remember that. I would I would still say that's one of the uh, most valuable lessons I've ever learned so far in my 30 odd years of my life. Uh, I think what uh, what I've done uh, is basically uh, when uh, Professor Nagarajan and his team uh, reached out to me and uh, told me to talk about, told me about this leadership lecture series and told me about uh, what they are doing and uh, having Adam and I come back. Uh, I said it's it's a great uh, it's a great idea it's a great initiative and I, I always wanted to be back and speak to students who and also kind of relate some of my stories that. Uh, that I have experienced over the last couple of years, and also be able to relate to maybe some of the challenges and thought process that some uh, some of you go through uh, as you finish your engineering or whatever uh, else uh, that you are actually doing here at IIT. So what I've put together is a few of uh, my lessons. Um, what I called it is basically my lessons from entrepreneurship and Wall Street. I'll tell you a brief background on myself, and I guess in the next slide, but. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is basically just leverage some of my learnings. Some of them might apply to you, some of them might not. But the idea is to basically share uh, my story and over the last decade. Uh, I was hoping to get 10 lessons for the 10 years that I've graduated since IIT, but unfortunately I was able to only manage 9 lessons. I tried hard but realized that that's all I have, so I'll stick with the 9 lessons. Perfect. Anyway, so I think the the idea, of, uh, if you look at my uh, PowerPoint, everything is in, in, in like a film reel. One, one is to make it sound very nostalgic, and the second thing, I'm a big movie buff. I think other than uh, spending time in uh, in uh, Godavari Hostel, which where I lived, I think the most amount of time I spent anywhere else in IIT was uh, the Open Air Theatre. So uh, I've, I've, what I've been told right now is that most of you. Uh, don't watch, go that much to open air theatres because you have internet and you download every movie that's there on BitTorrent and sit at home and or sit in your room and watch it. It's quite unfortunate. You should. I think uh, my best memories of Sarang or otherwise in IIT are all been at uh, at open air theatre. Anyway, so just a quick uh, background on me. Uh, so I, I graduated in 2002 from IIT. After that, I went to uh, Duke to Duke University to do a masters in engineering management. Has anyone here heard of that program, Engineering Management? Okay, cool. That's, that's what I expected. So when I went there, it was the first, uh, uh, I would say the first Indian who actually ended up doing that program pri primarily because I think it was not funded and no one was ready to really take the chance of paying $35,000 and hoping that they are able to recover that after the end of the degree. I guess I was naive and stupid enough to think, yes, that's a, it sounds like a very cool program. I really wanted to do something uh, which bridged the gap between uh, engineering and management and I really thought I was too early to do an MBA because like my seniors and everyone else told me that 
MBA is something that should be done after some industry work experience. So I looked around on 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 on, uh, on the websites or on the internet and figured out what are the other interesting programs out there. And the thing that kind of stood out for me was this Masters in Engineering Management at Duke, which is a, a joint program between the engineering school, the uh, the business school, and also Duke School of Law. It's a very interdisciplinary program which gave me a lot of perspectives from not just engineering but uh, management and law as well. So after that. Uh, uh, I like many people who wanted to go into the business side of things or the management side of things, not really knowing what that was. Uh, did what a lot of people do, which is decide to either do strategy consulting or investment banking. I decided to do investment banking. I joined Merrill Lynch, uh, worked in Wall Street for about four years, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions for them. Uh, so I was I joined there in 2005. Was there all the way up to, uh, to at the fall of 2008. So I saw the entire the rise of the financial empire and also the crash. Literally, I had balcony seats uh, looking at the entire crash. Learned a lot of lessons from there as well. Uh, but the thing that kind of was always uh, the thing that I was really always interested in, uh, and when I was sitting in these stairs too, was uh, to be an entrepreneur. When I was 20 or 21 years old, I did not really know what it took to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I always knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to do something myself, and that's that's the reason and that's the focus that I always had. And when I decided to do banking, also I always thought that's going to give me a foundation in management, business, etc. And that's that's the reason I decided to uh, join Merrill. So in 2008, uh, with the uh, with, with with the idea that I want to be an entrepreneur, uh, I moved back to India. Uh, but before I uh, started my startup, I think uh, I, I took a couple, uh, I took a few months off with the idea to iterate and understand what kind of a business I wanted to start. And uh, as some of you might know, uh, my co-founder is also an IIT Madras alum. Uh, his name is Ravi. Uh, we actually are childhood friends. We've been classmates from fifth grade. Went to school, college, IIT Madras together. We're roommates also in New York. So both of us wanted to be entrepreneurs. So this. The startup was in the making for many, many years before it actually happened, and uh, that's another one lesson that I'll focus on. So we started that. Uh, so we, I, I quit, uh, quit New York, moved back to India, started uh, iterating on an idea. But something that I really was excited about uh, uh, in 2008 was the whole uh, Barack Obama campaign. I don't know how many of you were in, involved, but uh, uh, or saw saw how what kind of an impact he made by living in New York. And seeing the whole uh, the the young America kind of rise up and uh, and go ahead and you know add the kind of momentum that uh, Barack Obama's campaign did, I was very inspired by that. So uh, what I wanted to do was take a, a few few months of break, work on my startup idea at the same time, encourage young Indians to vote, and that's how naive I was. I thought I'll move back to India, do that. Uh, so I put a presentation together and try to talk to a few schools and colleges and I wanted to come to and give talks like this. But uh, fortunately, uh, one of my other one of my other IIT Madras alum, uh, this guy called Jasmine Shah, was working for a non-profit called Janagraha. Uh, and he started this campaign called Jagore. Have you have any of you heard of this campaign? Which is about urban uh, registering urban voters. Uh, so that's the campaign basically I ran with Jasmine. I uh, was a head of marketing and communications. Had a phenomenal experience traveling across India, speaking to young voters, educating about political processes, talking about why people should vote and why people should participate in the political <coughs> process. So I did that for about six months before I started Mobstack in 2009. Uh, Mobstack is a is a is an early stage company. Has been uh, has been exciting times for us. Uh, in uh, in 2011, we were uh, at just India's hottest young entrepreneurs for Business World which has been a very exciting story for us. And uh, since then, we have steadily and uh, progressed. We have, uh, we have exciting partnerships with the likes of Google over the last uh, last year, which has been adding a lot of momentum. So that's kind of the quick and dirty, uh, crisp or concise uh, background on me. That's what I've essentially been up to over the last decade. As you've seen, I, I did an undergrad in chemical engineering, went, up, went on to do a master's in engineering management to do investment banking, and then worked for a non-profit and then decided to become an entrepreneur. So I've, I've done a lot in a decade, not something that I highly recommend, but it's something that, like my presentation <coughs> says, I just followed my gut. I just, I just did what I felt like, 
and at some level it was very stupid and naive and I fell down many times and learned the hard lessons and some of those lessons are what I want to be able to share with you today. So as I said, I have, I have nine lessons and each lesson I will try to articulate it how, as well as I can. So the first thing is, uh, the first lesson which is very close to my heart is uh, attention to detail, right? Uh, the reason I say that is, uh, as Indians, unfortunately, uh, you know, the whole concept of Jugaad is highly, I mean, it's very acclaimed. Uh, Jugaad is something people look up to. People uh, uh, in India, as the, if you're a generalist, you're actually highly more appreciated than being a specialist. People strive and thrive on the fact that oh, we are this is a Jugaad product. This is uh, this is Jugaad, and there is not really that much attention to detail. Uh, I remember uh, this this incredible story uh, about Steve Jobs uh, uh, when apparently he called the folks at Google when the first iPhone was coming out, and he was really worried that the Google search logo or that was there on the iPhone that was going to come out had a different shade of color which other uh, which was not really the exact shade that Google like Google's logo otherwise was. That's the kind of attention to detail which made Steve Jobs make brilliant products at Apple and Apple actually is such an extraordinarily successful company. Unfortunately, uh, in India, our Indians don't usually follow that. And I learned very hard lessons uh, doing that in, uh, in banking. I remember the first day I was in Wall Street uh, and uh, one of my managing directors asked me some financial metric from some company that we were following. And uh, he asked me, you know, can, can you tell me what the revenue of that company was? I, 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 and I remember telling him something in the ballpark number of saying, oh, I think around $100 million or something. And there was an analyst sitting right next to me uh, and this guy basically ended up saying 100.123 or something like that. And that immediately gave me a sense for, you know, that we are all about just getting ballpark numbers right. We were never about attention. We never talk about the details. We never focus on what is absolutely necessary. And it's this strive for perfection which actually makes extraordinarily products, uh, I mean, extraordinarily successful products or extraordinarily successful companies. And it's not something that we imbibe in. It's not something that uh, people are taught to. And that's something that needs to be learned in a very, very hard way. And I've learned it in a very hard way in many ways. The second lesson, right? This is, I would say, if there's one thing that has worked for me absolutely well, it's this. It's just that it's persistence. Time and again, I've seen uh, extraordinarily successful, I've met extraordinarily successful people, and there's, there's one common theme between all these people. It's just been that they've been at it over and over and over and over. Does anyone recognize who that guy is? I don't know if you guys can. Okay, that's not bad. So, yeah, so that's Angli. So, yeah, that's Angli with his uh, with his latest Oscar that he got for Life of Pi. But uh, you should you, you guys should go and search on Angli and figure uh, and uh, listen to his background or his story. And there's there's a story about how he was uh, when he was about 32 years old or 33 years old. He was a guy who basically had uh, three kids living in New Jersey and is living off his wife's salary. And he was always trying to do the right screenplays every month and send it. And each one was being rejected. And this happened for about six to seven years. So think about, this is 2013, and for the next uh, six to seven years, so till about 2020, you guys are all sitting and working on some particular thing, and that is really not yielding any results. And uh, you can only possibly imagine what kind of uh, frustration that uh, you would go through. And he went through the same frustration, but after that, after six or seven years of struggle, he obviously got his first break, and after that came Crouching Tiger, and. Brookback Mountain and obviously now the life of Pi, etc. That's just one story that I wanted to highlight in terms of what persistence does. I mean, I personally wanted to be an entrepreneur for over a decade. I've time and again come up with stupid ideas on, I think we should do this. I think we should do a Napster in India. There was ridiculous ideas that we've thought of and every time we care, I went with an idea to my social network, to my friends, to my uh, to people whom I respected, every time it was beaten down. But every time it was beaten down because there was a reason for be being beaten down, it was a stupid idea. But over the years, as I talked about it, as, as we focused and iterated our products and ideas, I eventually was able to start Monster. And that's the case with every entrepreneur, right? So there's no doubt about the fact that, uh, you know, persistence always pays. Uh, there's this uh, famous uh, dialogue in uh, Rocky, which I really like. 
And I'd say it's, it's not about how hard you're being, uh, it's not about how hard you hit, it's about how long you can stand when you're being hit. That's always it. Entrepreneurship is about that. I would say most of the successful people are all, all about that. It's all about, you know, when you're going through bad times, when you're going through a tough winter, can you just stand longer than the other person who was, who was standing in the line? That's all it takes. Lesson three, people matter, period. There's no doubt about it. Look at the people sitting next to you. Look at the people who are sitting to your right, people who are sitting to your left. What are the, do you know these people? What, how many people do you know actually in this room? If there's one thing that I took away from IIT, right? It was just that um, it's an unbelievable talent pool. And I can give you this in writing that I've, I've spent, uh, I've been to every university which is very acclaimed. I've worked in very high, uh, worked in places like Merrill Lynch and other organizations which are very highly competent people. But nowhere else in the world have I seen a quality or density of high class people from with diverse interests under one roof like I've seen in IIT. And for the four years, I was just talking this uh, uh, to a bunch of students uh, sometime back in Godavari Hostel as well and I was telling them, if there's one thing that you should be doing more of is just meeting more, meeting more people. Stop spending time in your room, talk to people, talk about anything under the sun. But the reality is that at the end of the day, these are the people who are going to help you the most, right? Uh, my my first when I started Mobstack, my first uh, angel for investor and a bunch of angel investors are all from friends from IIT, seniors from IIT, people who uh, who uh, who uh, the, the people who basically got me my first customer is, uh, is 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 a wife of one of my IIT classmates. There is no doubt about the fact that so networks and people matter a lot. Okay, and most importantly, I I, and I, I say this again is. I keep telling this to uh, many people that I believe in karma more than I believe in God. When you help people, it will definitely come back to it will definitely come back to help you somewhere. And there is no doubt about the fact that if you go out of your way and help people today, sooner or later, maybe in the next year, maybe in two years, maybe in five years, or maybe in ten years, you will definitely reap the benefit of that. I have seen that personally myself. So if there is one thing you should believe more than God, I would say you should believe in karma. Fourth thing, it's really okay to make mistakes. See, unfortunately in India, there's not that much of a culture to celebrate uh, failures. You know, people, people tend to think that mistakes, if you make a mistake, it's a big blunder, it's a big failure, it doesn't really make sense. But the reality is that the more mistakes you make, the more you learn. If there's one thing that's common to all successful people in the world, it's the fact that they have had extraordinary amount of failures very early on in life. At Mobstack, uh, uh, our motto is to make more mistakes. Not Don't make the same mistakes, that's stupid. And that obviously will not take my company anywhere. But make more mistakes. The ability for you to be able to take chances helps you grow tremendously. You will fall, you will fail, but that's the only thing way you will be able to learn. And irrespective of what people tell you, there is no doubt about the fact that mistakes help you with your learning. There is no doubt about that. Okay, this is a personal favorite of mine. Many people that you meet, right, will sound or project or talk like they're very good multitaskers. I right now as a CEO of a growth stage company, most of my time, I would say more than 50% of my time is spent in interviewing people. And if I ask people, what is your strength, which is a typical standard question that you would like to ask people, and invariably everyone will say, I'm very good at multitasking. And I say, why should you be multitasking? I mean, the reality is multitasking is massively overrated, right? The reason I say that is, invariably, they say that the human mind cannot process more than three priorities at a time, period. So that means if you are trying to do more than three things at a time, you will never be able to achieve it. So if some of you have been desperately trying to learn violin or guitar for many, many, many days right now and you have not been able to dent, or the fact that you really wanted to learn a little more of finance or you wanted to learn a little more of coding but you have not got yourself to it and you have been, you have been, the excuse you have been giving yourself is that, oh I have been very busy, guess what, busy is the decision. It, that is something that you have to be able to prioritize. If you do not prioritize, it will never get done. 
If you have more than three priorities in your life at any point of time, it will never be done. So focus on what you want to be able to do and do only those things. And never ever think that multitasking is a very cool thing. It never works. Beyond a point, there is no doubt about the fact that your quality of each task that you end up doing will definitely get affected. So focus on things that make sense for you. If, if what you want to be able to do today is focus on learning your core engineering discipline that you might be in. Maybe focus on something else that maybe you want to be able to learn coding. Or maybe you want to learn an instrument. If those are the three f uh, focuses that you have, then that's all it should be. Do not, do not have six things that you want to be able to do and actually think that you're doing a pretty good job at multitasking. It never works. At, um, at, at our company, we, uh, every, every, every manager has basically been given, uh, has to set, uh, at the beginning of the quarter, has to set three priorities for himself or herself, and has to set uh, three priorities for his own team. If you, set, you can't set more than three priorities. You can set less than three priorities, but you'll, I don't allow them to set more than three priorities. The reason is, again, the same thing. Nothing will get done. Or if whatever is done will be a, like the first lesson, will be a Jugaad project. It will never have the quality that you want to be able to do. So focus and prioritize. Prioritize and prioritize. That's a very, very valuable lesson that I learned very hard way. I have I've spent significant amount of time trying to, oh, I really want to learn the guitar, to oh, I really want to learn French, to I want to run a startup, to I want to build a big social network. Well, guess what? I really was not able to do a great job at any of these. So now I don't have more than three priorities. And if those three, if it's not in those three priorities, you have to ask yourself why and why are you doing it? This is how actually people who are extraordinarily successful and who are very, very busy actually end up doing things. <laughs> Barack Obama, who is the President of the United States and they're clearly a lot more busier than I am, definitely has time to run for one hour in the morning. So if I am giving myself the excuse that uh, the reason I'm not going to the gym every day is because I'm really busy, then I guess I'm either being naive or I just don't know how to prioritize. Very successful people prioritize insanely. They do not talk and do not do things that they don't matter to them. So multi multitasking is definitely overrated. This one. So be modest and curious. The first thing is modest and curiosity directly don't go hand in hand. So the first thing that should be crossing ahead is what does modesty have to do with curiosity? The thing about modesty, right, is that it helps you keep keep an open mind, right? If you if you if you think you're the know all, the reason Nandan Nirikani's picture is here is because I've had the phenomenal opportunity of interacting with him. And I, 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 and I spent an evening with him and I, I, I cannot forget that primarily because of how grounded he is. He's, he, he's a guy who's actually built a multi-billion dollar company, who's been uh, doing phenomenal stuff with UID, etc. But all he wanted to know was what I know about mobile and how he could leverage mobile or Android for his UID project. Here is a man who has done something so spectacular in life that I can only, only aspire to do a fraction of it, but he was very open, he was very modest, he was very curious. And the reason he's, he's able to learn so much is because he's grounded. And that if you're modest and if you're grounded, right, it helps you with that ability to keep a very open mind. And only if you have an open mind will you be able to learn. It doesn't matter how, how, how talented the people are around you, how, what kind of quality people are, you're surrounded by. But if you don't have an open mind and if you're not grounded in your approach, and you think you're you're the man or the woman or whoever it is, you will really not learn that much. That's the reason it's very very important. I've I've, I've met I've met uh, other than Nandan, I've met other extraordinarily successful people, and they they are so grounded. They are they are very curious. They are very grounded. They want to know what what you're doing. They want to know. They very always have an open mind to be able to learn more and more. And that's something that you should always keep in mind, especially when you graduate from IIT. Uh, you already have a chip in your shoulder. You already you feel you you arrived in life. You've learned a lot. You always went to the prestigious IIT, which is a phenomenally a big brand. So I keep say I, I keep uh, I, I keep joking with my uh, friends who graduated from IIT. I I keep saying this that uh, you know one percent of the people who graduate from IIT actually build a brand. The remaining ninety nine percent are using it. You want to be in that one percent. You want to be that one person who is actually adding value to IIT every day. You want to be able to go into the world and basically not open with the fact that you are from IIT. 
Like people discover it and actually give credit to the fact that you went to an amazing institution. That's what you should be doing. This is something which is, I always want to tell people and I always tell people. Twenties is frightening and very confusing. And that's very normal. If you are confused, if you are not sure about what you're trying to do, if you are baffled and your room neighbor seems to have figured everything else out, trust me, that guy is pretty naive or he or she is very naive. It is very normal to not know what you want to be able to do. It's very difficult to have the understanding or the maturity to say this is exactly what I want to do. If you are 22 years old and your friend comes down and says he knows exactly what he's doing to th when he's going to be 30, either he's joking, he's stupid, or he's basically playing just fooling around with you. There's no way you can do that. I think among all the things, if there's something that I wanted, if some, if there's one lesson that someone would come and tell me when I was 22 years old or 21 years old in this room, it would be this. Over the next decade, you will go through a lot of rough times. You will you will struggle. Some of you will end up going to further study. Some of you will go take up very pricey jobs. Some of you might become entrepreneurs. Some of you might go to IIMs and do an MBA. Every time you meet someone else from your batch or something, you'll always feel maybe I should have done that. Maybe I should have done this. Or the fact that this person seems to have figured out his life completely. He seems to know exactly what he's doing with his life. Trust me, no one knows anything. You might change your perception about what you want to do absolutely. Okay, and it's very normal. So if you are totally freaking out about the fact that, oh my God, I don't know what to do with my life and my four years are ending, guess what? You're one among everyone else. Everyone is. Some people are very good at making it sound like they know exactly what they're doing. Some people are not. I was one of those who pretended like I knew exactly what I'm going to do with my life. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and my friends who were in 98, 2002 who were there with me will also tell you that I always wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and I always pretended like I exactly knew what I was doing. Trust me, with inside me I was freaking out because I took all these random routes to what, what I wanted to do and the only way I was able to do that is I followed my heart but at the end of it I had absolutely no clarity. So next time anyone who walks up to you and makes it sound like he knows what he's doing, question it again. This is something very personal to me, right? It's very easy to give up on India. Most of you, are, uh, from what I understand, far fewer percentage of you are going going away to the US or elsewhere in the world to study, to to work, etc. But I've, I've, I've been there, I've, uh, I've, I've lived in the US, I've studied in the US and I've come back. I'm, there's no doubt about it. Many, many investors ask me and my co-founder Ravi all the time saying, why did you come back to start a product company in India? Because there is not that much of product companies in India. It's very so much more difficult. You could have easily done that in Silicon Valley. And the answer that we usually give is we are foolishly romantic. We are foolishly romantic with the notional idea of starting a product company in India. And that's, that's the reason we came back. But I want to tell you that for all the gibberish that you read in media every day and for all every every corrupt politician that's out there, there are insane number of people who are working really hard in trying to make India what it is right now. So it's too early in your life to give up on India. Don't give it up. Do you know who this guy is? Does anyone recognize this guy? Yeah, he's Vinil Krishna. He was actually my, uh, my uh, he was in Godavari Hostel too. He is basically a guy who, even when he was in Godavari Hostel, talked about helping India and creating impact and all these other things, which, which is very easy to talk when you're sitting on a wing cot and wearing a small shorts and you really don't know what you're talking about. All of us did actually. All of us talked about how we could eradicate uh, corruption and poverty and solve global peace when you're sitting in wings and have nothing better to do. But he's a guy who actually did it. He's the guy who joined civil services, has created some unbelievable impact in Orissa. He was the guy who was kidnapped by Maoists in Orissa and actually released primarily because of the kind of impact that he has created among tribals in Orissa. He's a role model for me in terms of uh, people trying to help, uh, help actually change India. So don't give up on India very fast. I was uh, part of this Jagare movement where uh, I had the unbelievable uh, opportunity of interacting with uh, with uh, government servants, with IAS officers, with a few politicians. 
And trust me when I say this, there's no doubt about the fact that there are retards, there are people who are very corrupt, incompetent. But for every five or ten of them, there is one or two people who are working really, really hard and working with absolutely no upside in making India move even at the snail's pace that it is going right now. And India has 500 million people below the age of 25. It's the youngest country in the world. You guys all, most of you I think would be below the age of 25 here. You have an amazing, amazing opportunity to create impact in India. So it's too early. I wouldn't say you should be doing this in India, but I'm saying don't give, it, give up on it yet. This is my last slide. Follow your heart. I'm just quoting Steve Jobs, who's, who has been an extraordinary amount of influence and inspiration for me in my life. The reality is, India is the land of unsolicited advice. Everyone will give you opinions. Anyone will give you opinions. Everyone will tell you what you should be doing. Don't fall into the rut. Don't fall and do a, get into a herd mentality. Don't. Uh, don't do it because, don't go to IMs because, oh, dude, it looks like it's the hardest thing. Or don't start up because someone like me is coming and giving you a gun and making it sound like it's a really cool thing to do. Don't, don't do a PhD because your mother really wanted to have someone do PhD in their family. It, it, these are all unbelievable reasons many people do it. And unfortunately, that's not really what you want to be doing. You know, Steve Jobs had this amazing uh, speech, which I'm sure all of you have read. And in that he says, your heart already knows it. It's just about you following it. You know what you want to be able to do. If you don't, it's completely fine. As I said earlier, 20s are all about being confused and frightened. But just don't take the easier path. Just don't do it just because your friends are doing it or because it seems like the easier thing to do. Follow your heart. It makes a huge difference. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful. It's going to be very frustrating. It, you will, there will be many nights where you will feel like, I just don't know what I'm doing with my life. But that's fine. That's normal. That's the way it should be. But when you're 32, like me, when you look back at the last 10 years, you might think it's successful. You might think it's you failed in a few things, but you will at least not regret every day that you spent with your life. And that's very, very important. That's very, very important. And I think just the last final thought, right? This is a magnet that I have on my fridge, which I wanted to show. It just says, what would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? What would you do today? That's something that you should ask yourself. That's it. Thank you. So if you have any questions, particularly, uh, just I'm asking from your experience, yeah. like uh, uh, single task doing is really difficult. Mm -hmm. Because your brain works in different fashions. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you just uh, tell me, uh, like, uh, whether you are doing two tasks or three tasks, mm -hmm. um, which one is more difficult to handle? So, for me, I personally, uh, so there are two things, right? One is basically uh, prioritizing and one is multitasking. So what I mean by that is, when I say pri prioritizing, it's talking about what you want to be able to do. My belief is that if you take more than three priorities, you will not be able to hang, give, do justice to any of them. The other thing is once you have prioritized, how do you actually deal with the task? If you have a person who counts multitask and tries to do two or three things at the same time, where you're trying to read the news at the same time, writing, uh, doing your work, that usually doesn't work. So there are two, th two elements to that. One is basically, in my personal opinion, I don't take more than three priorities at any point of time. And these three priorities would be across work and life. So for example, one my priority right now is I have to go to the gym. That's my priority. Then I have two more priorities which basically I attach to maybe work, work related stuff where, where I say I have to expand my sales in North America and I have maybe some other priority which is about hiring some. Uh, I have to close this position that needs to be done. These are only the three priorities that I work at any point of time. Two or three weeks later, if one of the priorities gets knocked out, then yes, then there's place for one more. But I don't take more than that. I can have lesser than that, but I won't take more than that. So how worried should we be about campus placements and about the first job? How worried? 
So when you say worried, it's, is, it, is it in terms of, oh, if I just take this company, will this kind of set the trajectory for the rest of the things that I'll do in my life? Is okay. it worrying from that point of view? Okay. Then you shouldn't be worried at all. I would say out of 10 years, I've done a lot of my job. Like for example, investment banking, working on Wall Street, <coughs> well, four years doing mergers and acquisitions for a bulge bracket investment bank it was like the, the hottest thing that you could possibly do in, uh, at least in my batch and I was doing it. But I would also say that more than 70% of what I did in investment banking was crap work. I was doing just a desk job and doing research and doing stuff. So every job right, has an element of where there's a huge amount of learning and there is a lot of element of grunge work. Especially if you're in an entry level position anywhere, you will be doing a lot of grunge work. If you're an entrepreneur, even at the CEO level also you'll be doing grunge work. So that's very different. So the question that you have to ask yourself is, are you learning at this job? It might not be the best job, but are you learning? So what I, I do is basically I wake up in the morning and I, I mean not every day and it's not like I do it for, you know in a very absolute way. But what I mean is every now and then I try to ask myself the question, am I learning? There's, there's a good chance that you don't know what you want to be able to do with your life. Uh, you, you are very confused to you as a, as a default since you're not very sure you've joined an IT services company. Sure. Because the reason I'm giving that example is because there are, I'm assuming there are a lot of uh, IT services companies that come and uh, hire. If you, if, you, if you join an IT services company also, you should ask yourself, are you learning something? And there is a lot to learn, trust me, because if you're 21, 22 years old and you've never worked in an industry before, Odds are there is a lot to learn in any role. Focus on the learning. If six months down the line you still think you are not learning anything in this job, or then you should quit and do something else. But focus on the learning. That's very, very important. What do you think are the skills that you can transfer from a corporate job? Say you started out as an investment mm -hmm. banker in Railways. Mm -hmm. And uh, what do you think are some valuable skill sets which you developed at that firm? That you can learn from any high stress job. If you did banking like me for four years where I slept uh, at, at uh, two in the morning and woke up at six in the morning every day to run back to work and uh, had to be accessible, that, that's actually the most important uh, skill that I got out of investment banking for entrepreneurship. But jokes aside, I, I, I think it's very difficult to quantify and say there are certain skill sets that are required to be an entrepreneur. I was just telling, uh, sharing with a few uh, student entrepreneurs sometime back in the afternoon actually that uh, what you end up uh, as an entrepreneur or as a startup, as a story, you know, what you start with to what you end up doing and to eventually what makes you money are three completely different things. Completely three different things. Every entrepreneur, including me, I meet uh, entrepreneurs every week, new guys, people like you who might have, who are interested or who have just started up. And all of them, when you meet them for the first time, they will come and tell you this, I have this very unique idea, which is has a phenomenally huge market, but has no competition in the market. <laughs> and then you're asking yourself, is that really possible? The reason they say that is, and I did the same mistake myself. The reason you do that is because invariably you start with a problem statement and you ask yourself, oh, okay, the, I'm sure this is my hypothesis. And you have not really, you don't obviously know because you have not really spoken to customers, you don't know what else is out there in the market. So the, the reason I'm saying, uh, I'm digressing from your question about skill is, there is very little that you know what you want to be able to do with your startup. You start there and then continuously iterate your product and build the skill sets that's required. But at the end, at the core of it, all it, it's all about going at it over and over and over and over and being persistent about it. That's a great question. Uh, actually, the, let me rephrase the question a little bit if you don't mind. I think more than what keeps me going is, is our, I would say what keeps me going is the same thing as what made me start. And that's actually something that everyone should ask themselves. In the sense that if you are, why, why are you looking to start up? In my mind, there was only one thing, okay? And, and that's the same thing with Ravi too. We wanted to be able to create impact. An impact can be defined in many ways. And don't get me wrong, this is not like some high moral standing that I'm taking. I want to make truckloads of money, there's no doubt about it. But having said that, 
Having said that, the number one reason I want to be able to start is being able to create impact. Create impact in terms of building an awesome product that's in the hands of millions of customers. I have customers in Iran, Nigeria, Indonesia, Malaysia, in some, uh, I have uh, customers in 40 countries. And the fact that there's something that I put my blood and sweat into, which is being consumed by people in different parts of the world, that's impact for me. The fact that I have an awesome team who every day wakes up in the morning and comes to work thinking that they're working on something cool, and and that's impact for me. I, uh, the fact that there are incredible investors who've invested a lot of money in my company riding on me, that's uh, and the ability for me to be able to make a lot more returns for them, that's impact. So the impact is what I, I, I think I wake up every day and think about. If I'm able to create impact, I think I'm very excited about it. Once I think he has a question, you can ask him. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a second year student. Okay. So, uh, I want to know if, uh, so do you suggest anything that can be done in this four or five years that the IIT, which can actually help us choose what we have to do later? What uh, you want to do later? I think it's 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 a it's a it's a, it's a it's a difficult process, primarily until unless you really know what you want to do. It's very difficult to figure out what uh, uh, what you want to be able to the, the way I do it is, or I have done it, is, is a more of a process of elimination than anything else. So for, what I mean by that is, there are some times where you feel, oh, this is really exciting, maybe I should do it. For example, maybe, maybe given the gap that I gave you now, you might somewhat think being an entrepreneur is really cool, maybe that's what I want to do. But what do you have to validate it? So what maybe you should do is go and do a summer internship in, in a startup. Experience life there. For all you know, you will come come back and you come work in a company like Mobstack and say, oh man, this is crazy. What the hell is this? I don't want to be doing that. So you at least eliminate an option. You want to be able to go and you want you, you say, I want to be able to do an MBA or I want to do management. Go and talk to people who have done an MBA. Talk to people who have uh, done, uh, who are in management positions. The, odd, the odds of talking to people who have actually been in those roles before, again, is incredibly helpful. You should talk to people. The, the reason I was stressing about the whole idea of network, etc. is also the same thing. People come here from very diverse backgrounds, so you, you should be able to reach out to them, get their contacts, get their perspective. That helps tremendously. But you have amazing summers. I mean, one of the things that I look back uh, is that one of the things I'm most unfortunate I feel is I wasted all my summers in IIT. I did nothing. I just went back home and chilled because I thought I was already in IIT. I had been there, done it, basically. You have two summers at least, and uh, then the first, second, actually three summers. And third, third year summer, you might be doing an internship, or the first year summer and second year summer, you should do something interesting. That's that's the best way to learn. That's the best way to learn. And in the, India has such low uh, talent pool with respect to even managerial positions and all. If you go and tell someone, I'll I'll work. You don't have to pay me that much in whatever vertical that you want. You are exci very excited about retail. Go and tell the supermarket, I want to work here. I'll just handle something. Many people will be more than happy to give it to you. You might not get paid much, but that's a great way to learn. Uh, I, for example, let me give you this example. I'm very interested in politics. I, I truly want to join politics. Maybe 10, 15, when I make enough money that I don't have to worry about it. But, uh, but that's something which <laughs> I've, I've, after living for four or five years in New York, right? It's very cool to say, oh, I want to help this starving child in, in Africa. It's very cool for people living in New York to say that. And I was very worried that, you know, I've become one of those where I'm just saying things and maybe I really don't need it. Maybe I don't. Uh, I also want to create social impact. I want to be, I, and I really want to be in politics. So despite having offers in private equity and other banking roles in India, before my doing, uh, Doing my, my doing small step, uh, I actively decided saying, okay, let me go and work for a non-profit. Let me see. Uh, let me work hands-on in poli uh, political uh, political processes, understanding this, and see if this really excites me. The answer may be no. It might be frighteningly different. But what I got out of this was incredible. I just revalidated the fact that no, this is something I really want to be excited about. So ten years from now, when I decide or 15 years from now when I decide this is it, this is what I want to be able to do, I can always look back at that learning and say, you know, I've done that, I like it, I know I like it, so I can take that chance. 
So do it in experimental buckets. That's very important. Sorry, question. Yeah, like, uh, how difficult was it for you to leave the job and then like, go to NGO and then have a own startup? Very difficult because my father is still recovering from it. <laughs> my father has been a banker all his life. I, uh, for him, uh, working in Wall Street was was the mecca. It, it, it could not possibly get better than that. And uh, from leaving a job in high flying uh, Manhattan and coming back and <laughs> saying first day that I'll start up and then after that uh, saying uh, I'll work for a non profit was shocking at, to say the least. So my father used to always introduce me to in social circles saying he used to be a banker, not talking about the fact that I'm currently an entrepreneur because for him that was equal to being unemployed. <laughs> And especially given the fact that I was working for the first 18 months, my, my startup, when we actually were declared India's hottest time entrepreneur, we were still in my apartment. We were still working out of my apartment because we couldn't afford the office or we didn't want to actually. So short answer is it is very difficult. It's very painful. It's very painful even more because you, you always, it's very human to compare, right? You might have the nicest friends around you who might not, um, who might not belittle you, but you will still compare yourself and say, yeah, I'm, Look at that guy, McKinsey, man. why did I leave this job? I could have easily been in McKinsey, I could have easily been in BCG, I could have easily been killing it and making a truckload of money, why did I do it? Did you get over it? I don't, you don't get over it, you live with it. But uh, at the, when you wake up in the morning, when you go to work, you feel a tremendous sense of satisfaction which cannot be compared. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. And also you, you, you should also Grass is always green on the other side. If you, now when I talk, obviously when I moved back to India and started up and all this, all my friends in New York and all the people who were doing backing, consulting, looked at me and said, oh good, interesting, uh, startup, oh, okay, nice. And they were like, I don't know what you're doing. Now everyone comes to me and says, yeah, this is really cool, this Indian ecosystem is growing and maturing, I heard it's a lot easier to start up, I'm thinking about it. What do you think we should do, and so on and so forth? And you're like, so the short answer is, it is very difficult. There's no doubt about it. I'll be lying if I said no, absolutely not. Uh, I woke up and I felt I'm creating impact. Henceforth, that was not. <laughs> it's frustrating as hell, especially when you don't have social support. You don't have a social network. I mean, I was, I got married only two months back, so I, uh, my social uh, network or my was unfortunately my parents were even more stressed about the fact that, look, you didn't even get married, no one will marry you now, you're, you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> right? So you, you have to lock, deal with a lot of social, uh, I wouldn't say social stigma, but you have to deal with a lot of social elements that come into play when you're trying to take the road less travel. And, and that's part of it, I mean, that's part of life, there's no doubt about it. If you want to live a pur life of purpose, right, and you want to be able to strive really hard and go in the direction that you want, you will live with it. But the, the highs that you get will be so high compared to anyone else who is doing a regular job. That's my take. So I've heard that people at Wall Street work for more than 85 hours a week and yeah. this end up having no time. Okay. So you're saying 70% of the work that you would did was crap. Mm -hmm. So in the rest of the 30%, uh, did you learn a lot about uh, venture capitalists and you know, pitching your ideas so that the share looks nice. Uh, did they really help in building your business? I mean, the amount I learned there cannot be compared to anything else. But what I learned there, the biggest takeaway from Wall Street was not finance. That uh, any anyone, if you read uh, Brady's and Mayer's corporate finance, you can learn that by yourself. You don't need uh, a Wall Street experience. Most of these lessons that I put there, most of them are from Wall Street. Attention to detail, the ability to, the, the, the concept of tenacity, the fact that you have to be persistent to get anything. These are things that it learned, uh, that, that it taught me the most. What else did it teach me? It taught me, uh, again, biggest advantage that uh, Wall Street gave me was, was the kind of network that I was part of. I had experience, I had a, uh, I was sitting in conference. I was sitting in meetings where I was obviously the the guy who was running around getting xeroxes of uh, of or photocopies of presentations that were being made. But I was sitting in sitting in board meetings of Fortune 500 companies. I was sitting in meetings of Fortune 10 companies where the CEO and the CFO were making decisions on how to sell a 25 billion dollar company. Those are experiences that are unparalleled. 
I, I spent uh, one hour talking to a CEO of a Fortune 500 company who was interested in listening to my ideas on whether he should expand into India. I was 25 years old. What was what did I know? I gave him perspective because he has never been to India, but I had a conversation with him. What it gives you is the confidence that you know what you're doing. That's very important. That is actually the most important thing. Whether you know it or not is <coughs> secondary. It's in, hopefully you're talking what you know, but the fact that you I mean, the amount of confidence Wall Street gave me cannot be compared. Okay, let's uh, thank you, Shara. Thank you.